so thank you again for everyone joining us. Um, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Akuna Rosser. I'm the Senior Assistant Director for Free Health Advising at MIT um, in the larger office of the Career Advising and Professional Development Office. Uh, CAPD, uh, Career Advising and Professional Development, is the office that supports students on campus with their career goals, whether it be exploring career, exploring career options, acquiring those opportunities that will make them competitive for their future career opportunities, and then helping students determine whether they're going into industry, applying for a variety of fellowships, graduate school, medical school, whatever that path is, CAPD, Career Advising and Professional Development, is that central place for that. Um, so I'm going to continue on. Um, I definitely will hope to leave time for questions, definitely should be, um, but definitely I'll try to keep track of those as we progress on. So if you have a quick question, feel free to add it in the chat. I'll try to answer it. If not, I'll, I'll come towards the end and definitely allow for others to ask um, as many questions as you'd like. Along with my email is there as well. Um, you can always email me directly or email prehealth.mit.edu, which is our central office's email. Okay, so to get started. Um, so just the goals for today, um, as I mentioned, provide an overview of our office. Um, our approach to advising students is what we describe as helping them explore their interest in pursuing a career in medicine, prepare for that opportunity, and then eventually with the application process, so helping them apply. Um, and so that's how we like to think about the different ways in which we support students. Oops. Um, I also want to highlight the opportunities for free health students to engage in. Um, this is one of the more prouder opportunities that I think um, uh, we've had over the past few years and that we've been able to offer a lot of new opportunities for students to engage in to help them not only explore their interests, but also to uh, prepare and bolster their applications. Um, throughout the presentation, I'll be giving a profile of current applicants, um, both from the 2021 and 2022 most recent cycles, and then just answer any questions that you have as well. And so this is the pre-health advising team. Um, we have my supervisor, the team lead, Alicia Carlson Bryan. She's our associate director. Um, she's actually coming back next week from maternity leave. Um, and so we have myself, um, where in my role, I manage a few different um, programs for students, including some mentoring programs, our shadowing program with MGH, uh, uh, sorry, MGH, Boston Children's, and Tufts, um, and a few other opportunities, including our clinical research externships. Um, we have my colleague, Erica Long, who's recently joined us. Um, she comes from a past uh, career path in veterinary medicine. Um, so she's bringing a lot of great experiences with that um, to our team. And she also coordinates a few other opportunities for students. We have Julia Mongo, our staff writer and advisor. Um, she's a central part of our office. But in particular, if your student, if your child at some point is considering a fellowship, in particular, a Rhodes Scholarship, a Fulbright, um, these are things students are commonly uh, acquiring at MIT, also for pre-med students, she'd be a great person to connect with. And then we also have um, Abdul Noir, program assistant, um, who's one of the more front-facing um, folks in our office, and that a lot of students engage with him in terms of emailing, connecting to our office, and setting up meetings. Um, so this is our uh, pre-health advising team um, here. We also have a faculty committee that supports us as well, um, and they support us in terms of providing us with opportunities to connect students to them in their labs and their resources, even if it's just a matter of speaking to a student about the career path that they have. Um, these are faculty members that assist us. They also assist us with the committee letter writing process, which I'll get into a little bit later. Each student that applies to medical school from MIT receives a committee letter, um, and that letter is written in conjunction with our office and then each of these committee members, depending on who the student works with directly. Um, some of these faculty are physicians, both Matthew Van Heiden, who's the director of the Coke, he's an MD, PhD. Uh, Kristen Ann Naus, uh, she's a new member of our committee. She's an MD, PhD as well, along with Jacqueline Niles, Giovanni Traverso, and Omar Yilmaz. So we have at least one, two, three, four, five MD, PhD um, faculty, and the others work in a variety of disciplines that are related to medicine and healthcare overall. So in terms of our services, um, I mentioned the committee letter. I'm gonna get into that in a second. Um, we also offer essay critiques for students. Um, so if you're applying to an internship, um, to one of the uh, flex med programs or one of the early entry med programs that you can apply to as a sophomore um, or any other opportunity, especially once you're entering the application process that we're currently in right now, we're working with students on the essay critiques and their personal statements. That's a service we offer, mock interviews for any opportunity, including applying to medical school, but internships and other opportunities. As I mentioned, the physician shadowing program. So we have one that's currently 
going on with MGH, Boston Children's and Tufts. And it's it's great because it wasn't actually occurring uh, prior to this because of COVID, but we've been able to um, increase that um, and hope for next year to increase it back to what it was. And I'll speak on that a little bit later. Workshops and school visits, but overall, our main core service is individual advising. And you can see here on the right, these are the different types of topics that we discuss in an individual advising meeting and anything else. Um, so do I even want to be a doctor? I'm considering a doctor or being a PhD researcher. What's the difference between MD and MD PhD? When should I apply? What courses should I take? How should I prepare for this summer? These are all just very common questions and common topics we talk about um, during our one-on-one -on -one sessions um, with pre-health advising. And in particular, applicants, um, students that work with pre-health advising would be working directly with myself, my colleague Erica, and then my other colleague that I mentioned, my supervisor and team lead, uh, Alicia carlson Bryan. So as I mentioned, um, our kind of mission and, and focus in the office is just helping students explore, prepare, and apply. And this is just a nice graphic that I think helps kind of highlight that pathway in terms of a first-year student coming to campus. They're at the primarily explore stage, even if they know they definitely want to be um, involved in a career in medicine, whether it be a physician, an NP, a PA, or a variety of other career paths within healthcare, we're still in the process of helping them explore what that looks like. And so some of the opportunities that I'm going to highlight moving forward are mainly from this realm of explore, the different opportunities and ways in which we help students explore these opportunities. And the first one we have is really prior to students even really engaging in core campus activities. It's our FPOP. And FPOP stands for First Year Pre-Orientation Program. And so we offer one which we call Discover Pre-Health FPOP. And so it's running from Tuesday, August 22nd to Saturday, August 26th this year. Um, you can apply for this. There's also a fee associated with it. Um, and we take on 25 students per year. Um, and we have them engage in all these different activities that are listed here. So we research, we visit labs. Um, we visit labs both on campus. Uh, we visit the Broad. We visited some uh, uh, Novartis in past years, Beth Israel. Um, we go to their Shapiro Simulation and Skills Lab Center. Um, we tour different places in Cambridge. We have a lot of alumni and practicing physicians speak. Um, last year, we had what we called an MD hyphenated panel where we had different physicians who have hyphenated career paths. So whether it be an MD MPH, an MD and uh, MD PhD, and then an MD MBA speak on those different things and then end up discussions with current students and just a lot of you know, new opportunities to meet students and, and other people. Um, I see a question, is this session relevant if you are a bio, if you are, if you are biological engineering? If you're interested in majoring in biological engineering, uh, course 20, it could be relevant and that, that could be a potential path for you, but this is not specifically on biomedical engineering at all. This is primarily focused on uh, discussing how the pre-health advising supports students uh, applying to medical school and other health profession programs. And so that's uh, one of the programs. Another opportunity we have students help explore their career interests in healthcare and medicine is the uh, Alumni Advisor Hub and the MIT Infinite Connection. And um, the Alumni Advisor Hub, I'll get to those questions. This uh, I think is primarily for admitted students, uh, primarily admitted parents uh, of, of those students. The Alumni Advisor Hub and the MIT Alumni Infinite Connection are websites that MIT has, um, and I'll show these here, that allow students um, to talk with current alumni working in a variety of different fields. These are some images towards the bottom of sample alumni that you might see in there, um, but you'd see a ton of different physicians um, once you enter the site and see all the different physicians, whether it be in their residency years, their fellowship, they've been practicing for years, maybe they provide direct patient care, then maybe they're running a company. There's so many diverse career paths that we're seeing with MIT alumni that are physicians, and it's a great opportunity that students can use this alumni advisor hub to meet with them. What can also come from this is other opportunities, whether it be career conversations, resume critiques, job shadowing, internships, and so many other opportunities as well. Another opportunity that we offer students is mentoring opportunities. And so we have those in conjunction with the MPS, the Pre-Med Society. So that's an opportunity to connect with that organization on campus. It's a student club. We have the Alumni Advisor Program. This is fairly new. We haven't fully rolled it out, but it's an opportunity for students to fill out a form and they can re request to speak to an alumni with a variety of different parameters of, I wanna speak with an MD PhD that's attending this type of school with this major, we can find that alumni for them and we can connect those two students. 
And then for students who are particularly interested in an MD-PhD program, we can connect you with alumni who are at different medical schools, particularly once you're entering the uh, application phase, so just to explore and prepare um, and practice interview skills related to the MD-PhD, um, writing personal statements, and a variety of other things as well. In addition to that, we also have what I described as our FPOP earlier. We have reunions throughout the year just to kind of maintain that energy and um, the culture that we build during that, that week-long program, it's really great to kind of keep all that going on, along with gatherings for just the general first-year student body that's interested in free health. As I mentioned, the uh, alumni advisor uh, program that I mentioned, this is just the website um, that we've recently kind of developed and still kind of in the process of, of rolling out, but it's just another opportunity for us to help students explore their interests in, in pursuing medicine and other career paths. Another opportunity we help students um, to explore a career in medicine is a class that I teach in the fall called Careers in Medicine. Um, and so the class is a what we call a first year discovery subject. And first year discovery subjects are a variety of courses on campus um, where different offices, faculty, majors, they just want to provide something a little bit different, um, less technical in nature per se, um, just to help students explore a new interest. And so we decided to offer one. Um, it's only offered in the fall. It's six credits, but it's also on the PNR basis, which all first year students are on. Um, and then if you are in that class, you, did, you do get priority for a physician shadowing program. Um, this was our um, syllabus for 2021. Um, I didn't get a chance to fully update it yet. Um, but these are just some names. If you have an interest in seeing this past year's fall 2022 syllabus, I'm happy to share that. Feel free to email me. And then on this next slide, I have some just images of our most recent class. In 2021, that was an interesting time. It was us coming back from COVID. So we didn't have much opportunity to be in person. Um, obviously, students are not wearing masks. We couldn't really go into some of the labs. But this past year, I had a great, um, it was great. We got a chance to kind of um, go to different labs. So this First slide here is an activity we do in the class. We call it a value sort card activity. Um, and it's a way for students to really think about their values as it relates to their career path. And what are their values and how important are those as it relates to their different career paths. We got a chance to visit the clinical research, the Clinical uh, Center for Translational Research, which is a, a lab on campus that primarily focuses on clinical research. The research that's particularly involving uh, humans for the most part. Um, and so we visited there and you can see different uh, images there. Of, of where we are. Uh, down at the bottom left, we have Brianna Stevenson. She's an assistant professor of biostatistics at uh, TH Chan, and she's an alumni. Um, and then we also have Angela Kohler, who is a faculty member um, in uh, biological engineering. She works in the Koch Institute, and we got a chance to visit her lab um, in her space in the Koch Institute as well. So this is a great opportunity for students to uh, just explore and learn about because we do have PhDs, we have MPHs, we have MDs, we have a variety of people working within the larger field of medicine come and speak to students. As I mentioned also, we have a physician shadowing program. Um, it's been on pause for the most part um, in terms of what it typically would produce. And in a typical year from past years, we would place roughly 85 plus students um, within the hospitals listed. So we have MGH, Mass General Hospital, Boston Children's Hospital, and then Tufts Medical Center. Um, this past year, we were able to uh, place a few students in Boston Children's um, Hospital and Tufts. Um, what the goal is for 2024, we'll be fully uh, ramping up to our, our um, previous uh, ways in which we were uh, prior to the uh, to pandemic, which has made some of the restrictions in working with a hospital um, a little bit difficult. And so that was uh, just uh, our kind of focus on explore. If anyone has any quick questions on how we help students explore a career in medicine, I'd be happy to address those really quickly. Um, um, we'll send out the uh, FPOP application, all admitted students um, to MIT. And I'm thinking once you confirm your attendance, um, the office of the first year will send out information on all the FPOPs that we have on campus. And so the the biological engineering, they have an FPOP. Um, an office on campus that we partner with, the Priscilla King Gray office, they have an FPOP. Um, there's a variety of ones. Uh, I think fraternities and sororities have them. Some athletic departments have one. So it might be that there's a variety of interests that one might have in an FPOP. So um, definitely kind of work through them all. Um, feel free to join ours. Um, but if not, you know, you still can enjoy the, joining that class. But even if you're not in any of these opportunities that I mentioned in Explore, I still encourage a first year student considering a career in medicine to at least meet with us within their first semester on campus, if not their first year, just to really think about 
how they want to navigate the process, navigating MIT, engaging in different experiences, and just you know to really create that path for themselves that's going to set themselves up for success. Um, so again, just to kind of revisit that, applications for FPOP will go out roughly maybe late May-ish, I would say, um, and then we start making decisions um, around that time period as well. Hope that answers the question. Place out of biology and chemistry. Interesting question. I'll get into that. Um, I'll get into that uh, really quickly. So the question is, if your child has any intention of going pre-med, should he not try to place out of biology and chemistry upon entering? Um, so I think biology and chemistry are worthwhile classes to consider taking, um, whether it be if you bring in AP credit or ASC out of it. Um, but typically for those particular subjects, it's more so MIT's policy and the variety of medical schools policy that in particular for those subjects, they're not going to satisfy the GIRs. Um, but there's a variety of other things in terms of ASC for physics, ASC for math, that one should consider um, as they come in. Because if they do ASC or bring AP credits to fulfill those classes, medical schools will still expect them to take upper level classes in a physics subject. Um, so if it's not your major, if you're not a ma majoring in physics and you either ASC out of physics or ASC out of math or AP out of math and physics, you'll then still be required to take an upper level physics or math class to demonstrate competency in that subject matter, regardless of what you've done with the ASC or AP exam, which could be an additional class that you have to take that you may not want to. So it's just something to explore. And that's why I recommend um, applicants really just reach out to uh, ASE. It's the advanced standing exam. Advanced standing exam is an exam applicants, sorry, not applicants, first year students, um, and all students can take. Um, and so you can take that exam to be placed out of a class that you would have to take, typically a GIR. So if you don't want to take intro biology, which all students on campus have to take, you can ASC out of it, meaning you take an exam, and that exam, based off your grade, demonstrates competency, and they say you don't have to take it or you do have to take it. Uh, the question is, students unsure about a career in medicine, who should he schedule first with to discuss further? It could be anyone in our office. So once um, they are on campus, they will just reach out to our office. They contact Abdul. Um, and they just say, we want to schedule a meeting with pre-health advising, and they would schedule a meeting with either Erica, um, my colleague Alicia, or myself. And then we would just kind of talk them through the process, uh, maybe encourage them to think about shadowing opportunities, or maybe opportunities to use some of the resources that I've described, maybe speak to an, uh, an alumni in the field, or maybe a current student that's pre-med. Um, those would be some of the routes that, that we would recommend. Uh, but I would say initially, just meet with any of us um, during their first time on campus to really think about how they want to navigate this path. Um, because there is a point point, and, and we're here now at number two, we do want to start pivoting towards, I'm definitely applying to medical school. Let me start preparing so I have the strongest application upon applying. Um, so I'm going to progress on um, just a little bit. There's a few questions on courses, um, and I do want to allow time for me to get through the other things as well. And I think some of the questions that we have on coursework will be answered as we progress on. Um, and so in terms of academic preparation at MIT, this is one of the unique things that I think about MIT that's most beneficial um, in terms of being a pre-med student at, here at MIT as compared to other universities across the uh, country. So for instance, nine general institute requirements are prerequisites for medical school. So students, anyone at MIT that comes here has to fulfill general institute requirements. And that's the case for, I think, for most colleges. When I was in college, I had like a baseline set of courses I had to take in sciences, education, sociology, et cetera. It's the same thing for here at MIT. You have to take classes in physics, math, English requirements, um, biology, chemistry, et cetera. Now, nine of those required courses, nine of those required GIRs, they're prerequisites to medical school. So I like to tell students on campus, regardless of what you're majoring in, what career path, you're kind of a pre-med student, whether you want to or not. So you're taking prerequisites, you're taking those physics classes, you're taking those bio classes, and to a degree, that's a benefit because MIT is requiring this, whereas that if you are at another university, you may not be required to take a physics class. You might not be required to take a biology class. So then it's up to you to really kind of decipher through your major and academic advising when and where to take these different classes. Where at MIT, you can't graduate with taking physics. You can't graduate with taking biology. So what happens is a lot of applicants later on, they realize, oh, I now want to be a doctor during senior year. The benefit being they've taken the majority of prerequisites to medical school. They don't need to take classes once they've graduated or enroll in a postback program. Another benefit is that your first semester is all on PNR. This is regardless of what anyone can do. No medical school will ever see it. No student, no parent, myself. You're not going to see those grades and those won't be delivered to medical school. 
All medical schools are aware of that and accept that. So I think that provides a nice platform for students to come into MIT and really think about what's my studying style? What are the different habits that I really need to develop to ensure academic success here? How do I navigate all these different interests I have? It allows one to really come to MIT and figure out these, these initial things prior to really engaging in some of the more rigorous courses. First year discovery subjects, year ops, undergraduate research opportunities, the well-known rigor of MIT, and then there's also, I can also share this as well, um, as I'll have everyone email, uh, but there's more uh, information. If you just Google pre health advising academic courses, you'll find all of our coursework and all of our information there. Um, in terms of our 2021 cohort, um, this roughly doesn't change much, um, maybe the numbers of applicants per se, but in terms of the amounts and what's most of our pre-med cohort or what's the majority of our students majoring in, it doesn't really change. Um, in that it's not unsurprising that the majority of our students would major in course seven because they're interested in pursuing a career path that focuses on biology and the body. The second would be the case for course 20 and course nine, though they're both involved in, you know, the human body. But we've also seen an increase in students majoring in course six, seven, which is a combination of computer science, electrical engineering, and biology, um, or the six, nine option as well. We find a lot of students really want to take advantage of the uh, electrical engineering and computer science skill set that MIT offers. Um, so this is just a glimpse of what students uh, major in, but I necessarily wouldn't say that there's a correlation between these majors and one success going to medical school. That's gonna be more a result of how you perform in your classes, the activities you engage in, your rec letters, obviously, your statements, your writing, et cetera, exams and all that. So I've seen applicants who are in course three or course 18 or course 18 management, um, course five have equal success as others. So I just wanted to at least show this to show this is what it looks like, but this doesn't necessarily correlate to success in the application process itself. In terms of uh, success rates for our most recent cohort, um, our acceptance rate was 73%. I'd say our acceptance rate since I've been working here since 2016 has roughly hovered around 70%, 80%, anywhere in between there. Last year it was 75%. Um, and so you can see that in comparison to the national average, which is roughly 40%, um, for an acceptance rate for medical school might even be a little bit lower, but it's roughly around 40% national rate. Um, MIT students do fairly well, not surprising. And this is across a variety of different schools, from top tier schools to schools across the 150 plus um, of where someone can go for medical school. Um, and just to kind of give some details on, um, these are the accepted rates for GPAs as well. So the primary GPA medical schools are going to consider for a applicant is your biochem physics math. Um, so I'm going to highlight that a little bit. Um, so, you know, just average BCPM area right here, your biochem physics math, those course that those courses are going to be the primary courses medical schools focus on in terms of evaluating your GPA. This is the GPA range of students accepted to medical school with a biochem physics math. Um, and so at MIT, they have a GPA range of up to 5.0. You're seeing here 3.0, 4.0. I'm just dropping in a number to kind of evaluate it and equalize it with more like national uh, GPAs. Um, so roughly 3.0 to 4.0 is our acceptance range. Uh, for cumulative, it's 3.7 to 3.7 average with a cumulative range of 3.12 to 4.0. So to me, this just suggests that applicants are being admitted to medical school with a variety of grades. Students are receiving Bs, which is a common question. Can you get a B and go to medical school? That's I would say very common uh, to a degree. Um, and you know, this is also one of the ways in which our committee letter can support students as well, particularly if they're on the lower end of the GPA. And I'll get into that a little bit later on how our committee letter supports students. And then our average MCAT score, um, a little bit higher this cycle, last year it was 516, but more importantly, I try to provide the range as well. 508 to 528 was our range for accepted applicants. Um, this past cycle, and our most common scores were 515, 516, 518. Uh, another graphic that at least I like to show with students is that our rejected range is slightly similar um, in that just to kind of highlight, it's less about the academics per se, though it is, um, but we've had applicants who have a 4.0 GPA, a 526 MCAT score that don't have that much success nor get into a medical school. So that just results and puts the focus on what are their interview skills look like. Did they demonstrate a strong interest in serving others by engaging in long-term volunteer work? Did they shadow enough physicians? Did they acquire enough research experience or a variety of other things, the timing of their application, their written materials, rec letters, all these things come in to really determine 
um, where one goes and their level of success in the application process. In terms of the other things we try to help students prepare um, during this process, we help them prepare their application. So what are the different experiences that are fairly common? And see, these are just some common experiences. Um, I could provide a, a ton of other options as well, but I just figured I'd provide a, a nice diverse glimpse of, we have a lot of athletic um, students that are athletes. Um, we have students who do fellowships. Um, we have students who do things that are completely unrelated to medicine on campus and related to medicine, different leadership opportunities, internships. These are just some common things students um, are doing on campus. And we really work closely with them during these individual advising appointments to really think about where's your interest? Um, what are you interested in doing on campus? Um, and if there is an interest in a particular thing, then we can connect them with the students who's already engaged in that experience as well to kind of really confirm to them if that's the best option for them moving forward. There's also a lot of opportunities we can connect students to when it comes to volunteer and service experiences. As I mentioned earlier, the Priscilla King Gray Center, um, they are an office camp on campus solely dedicated to providing service experiences and opportunities for students to engage in service and volunteer. Um, we also encourage students to use volunteer match and idealist.org. And then also on our website, we have a list of common volunteer experiences. Um, so that's one of the things we also try to do as well, try to be as tailored as possible. So if I'm meeting with a student and I realize there's a new volunteer experience in Boston or somewhere else I hadn't heard of, I'm going to be adding it to this list of common volunteer experiences as well. I see I have a question. Um, so uh, uh, going back to um, this, um, I don't have it on here just yet, um, but are acceptance rates higher for MD PhD programs as opposed to MD, just MD ones? They actually are higher, um, which I think people find surprising um, given the, uh, I think the small nature of an MD PhD program. So they're inherently very competitive, but also much smaller. Um, but I think the student reason why um, students um, at MIT, um, there's a higher acceptance rate and they have more success than your traditional MD applicant. I think that's a, a, a real result of our Europe's uh, undergraduate research opportunity programs um, where students, there's really no application process, quote unquote. Students just really email a faculty member and say, here's my resume, here's my interest, I like your work. The faculty uh, responds saying, well, come join our lab, come meet with me. And then after that, typically it's, it's a quick onboarding process as opposed to other universities I've worked at where there's an application process, there's an interview process, um, it's very structured. It's completely unstructured on campus um, to acquire a, a research opportunity. And I think because of that, that really aligns well with the PhD part. Um, and it is the reason why a lot of MD PhD students um, applicants have more success than MD applicants because that research part is carrying a lot more weight um, than it would for an MD applicant. Okay, um, so moving on, internships, research, and job opportunities. Um, these are another way in which students can really prepare and develop a strong application. So as I mentioned, the Europe system here, over 90%, um, I probably, I would even argue, if not all, students at least engage in some form of the Europe at some point, and this is very common for pre-med students because there is that shared interest in engaging in research as it relates to medical issues. One of the things I highly encourage, partially because I did not take advantage of it when I was in college, and I still regret it, um, is just engaging in some form of travel abroad. Um, and MISTI is one of the greatest opportunities for that, and that the MISTI office in particular can pair a, a student on campus with a research opportunity, an internship, or a teaching opportunity abroad. Um, so this is one of the things I strongly encourage the students um, because it's a great cultural exchange experience. Um, for all students and, and I think helps them grow in a variety of different ways. Um, so that's a great space for students once they're on campus, they can meet directly with the MISTI um, representative and we even bring them to our FPOP as well and they come to a session on how to navigate the MISTI process, options to do in MISTI and where you wanna do those. I'm also thinking of our Handshake platform um, in the larger CAPD office. Handshake is a website that has a lot of different job listings specifically catered towards MIT students as well. So this is just another space in which students can acquire opportunities. And then this is also one of our newer opportunities as well, the IEP Medical Interpreting Course. Um, on the right side here, here's an article that's online um, that our colleague Julia Mongo recently wrote. She's the one who spearheaded this effort. Um, and so we realized um, MIT in particular is a very diverse campus. We have students coming from all, you know, all, all countries, I mean, all backgrounds and all diasporas. And a lot of times students have had experiences working with their parents, maybe their grandparent, a family member interpreting for them, whether it be growing up or just that, that I, th I think that cultural competency, that cultural connection is, is very strong on campus, particularly as it relates to languages. And so in conjunction with Julia Mongo and students, uh, particularly at Lingual, 
they decided let's develop a medical interpreting course, in particular for students who are interested in pursuing careers in medicine. So this is our second year offering it. We were able to get a grant to continue it. So it's now fully funded and we'll be offering it continuing on. So we're really happy about um, this, this class and students love it. We were able to place 30 people um, in this class this year and they're all gonna be going on to their certification exam um, throughout the rest of the year with the goal of them being placed in a hospital or some other clinical setting providing medical interpreting services uh, for patients. So this is a great service that we really enjoy and, and like to promote. And so those are just some of the brief ways we like to promote how we prepare applicants through some of the services that we offer. But I, I don't even know if I mentioned everything. There's so many things uh, for students to engage in, which actually can be often a challenge for students. It, it might be there's just there's so much to do here. I don't even know what to do. Um, so when those situations do arise, we strongly encourage students to work with our office to really think about what's the pros and cons of engaging in one experience. Um, do I need to do it now? Maybe I can do it another semester. Maybe you could do it in conjunction with another experience. So again, when students are on campus and they're realizing there's so many things to do, I think that's a great way in which um, the advisor in our office can, can help out. So I'm not going to pivot to apply and, and try to allow for, for some time for questions as well. And so once students have determined through exploring, I'm interested in being a doctor, they've explored it, they've confirmed their interest in that career path, then they've prepared their application and they feel they're in the strongest place possible to ensure acceptance to a medical school. Then they enter the application process where we're supporting them by applying to medical school. And we also have a variety of different one-on-one -on -one individualized services um, for, I would say, a small cohort. Um, if you think about the slide that I had earlier on the amount of students applying is roughly 70 or so students each cycle. Um, so in this cycle, again, we roughly have 70 to 75 students applying. And so we have three advisors dedicated to each of them to meet with them throughout the cycle. I see a quick question coming in. Uh, we don't have, I would be interested in what do you mean by a top medical school um, and what that number looks like, whether it be US News. We also should know Harvard is not a part of US News rankings anymore. Um, so I'd be, I'd be interested in what top medical school means, but unfortunately, because of that nuance and kind of subjectivity around that topic, um, we don't necessarily have data specifically on like the top 10 US news going to, uh, um, so I, I, I wouldn't say we necessarily have a, a measure of, of, of that. I would say our focus is more so ensuring we help students get into the medical schools of their choice. Um, and so our data is mainly focused on that because students do realize I may not be a good fit for the top 20 schools but I might be a good fit for the other 75 and have even more success than someone applying only to the top 20. Um, so we unfortunately don't have data specifically around that, but what we do do with students when we enter the uh, application process, if someone wants to know what is my GPA and MCAT score, excuse me, my GPA score and MCAT score in conjunction, what does that look like in terms of success for past applicants? And this is a, a common meeting we've been having this past week. Um, we can sit down with applicants and provide them a list from past years of if you've had a 3.8 GPA and a 512 MCAT or 518, here's the schools where applicants with that profile have gone to over time. So that's something that we can do um, for this uh, individual once they are on campus um, at, the, at that point. Does each pre-med student get assigned to one pre-advisor who writes his or her recommendation? Um, no, we don't assign them. We do find students assign themselves. So we find, I might find the students working primarily with Erica, or they might decide I prefer to work with Akuna, or maybe with uh, my colleague Alicia. And that's, I think that's great. It provides a diversity of experience because we all bring a variety of different skill sets and backgrounds. In terms of the committee letter though, um, that is determined by the person that they meet with for, and I'm gonna get into this in a second. Each person that receives a committee letter has a committee interview. I'm putting major quotes around the interviews, not really like an interview where it's zero sum. If you don't do well, you don't get a good letter. Everyone, regardless of their performance um, during that interview, gets a strong letter. Again, our goal is to get everyone in the medical school. Um, and so whoever writes that committee letter is determined by who that person, who the student uh, meets with. Um, so currently right now, we're doing our committee interviews. Um, if the student is meeting with me and a faculty member that's listed earlier, will be the ones um, writing their, their letter um, in conjunction with other staff members in the office. Um, and so someone, I uh, saw so another question directly to Abdul, can you major in mechanical engineering and pre-med together? Absolutely, I think you can major in anything to be honest. It's really a matter of 
you know, if you were at a, a school that had more humanities, you could major in English and apply to medical school. It's just a matter of have you completed the prerequisites to medical school and have you engaged in those more important experiences medical schools are looking for? In particular, what I would say the four most important experiences are to have demonstrated in the application, uh, leadership, clinical experience, volunteering in a non-clinical setting and volunteering in a clinical setting. Those are the four top experiences medical schools see the most importance on. Um, and that's based off a variety of things that you can find on the AAMC website um, as well. Um, so just getting back to this slide, this is one of the ways in which we directly support our students on a one-to-one -one basis. So whether it be general appointments. So the students who are currently in the process of applying, which we call by our incurs deadline, June 30th of 2023, we're literally currently having these appointments um, in conversations today, this week. So who should I choose for my recommenders? I'm thinking about asking this person, but I've been in this person's class longer and I've also TA'd with them. So we can just kind of walk through them that process, deciding where to reply. As I mentioned earlier, I've been meeting with students um, who have maybe a lower GPA, a lower MCAT score, and really giving them those, those lists of since 2015 or 2017, whatever it needs of here are the applicants with your profile and where they've gone. Completing the application, we help them with their activity section. We help them write personal statements. Once things transition into the fall, we help them with mock interviews. Um, whether you have an MMI, which is called a multiple mini interview, um, some schools offer, or just a traditional one, we do those. And you also get personal statement assistance um, through us. But there's also other offices on campus, in particular, the MIT Communication Lab, each major has a communication lab that helps students with their science writing and personal statements and the writing center as well. I just have about two more slides that I'm just going to get to and then I'll open them up completely for questions. Uh, we also offer cohort based, cohort based workshops. Um, so we have a variety of different workshops on writing personal statements, completing the AMCAS application. When I say AMCAS, that's the medical school application. The AAD SAS in Acomas, those are DL schools, dental schools, veterinary medicine schools. We have group advising sessions workshops. We did one earlier last year on medical ethics. Um, we have panels where we have a variety of admissions reps comes from each of those schools listed there and other places and then alumni panels uh, throughout the year as well. And then lastly, in terms of thinking about what a committee letter is, a committee letter is not something offered by every institution. Um, some schools have a variety of opinions on them. A lot of reasons why a school may not even offer a committee letter might have to do with capacity as well. Um, in terms of when I speak of capacity, meaning a school may not, a school may have so many applicants, that it's just really hard to write a letter for them, um, or just that just takes a lot of the staff's time. Luckily, we don't have a significant amount of applicants here at MIT, and we have a lot of support from faculty and staff that were able to write a letter for each applicant applying to medical school. If you're thinking of what a visual of this letter looks like, I would say it looks like, a, if, you're, if you're applying to a job, it looks like a cover letter to a degree. And or that's like the focus and that we're giving a very brief overview of each applicant and their strengths, while also trying to think about how can we mitigate any weaknesses. So if someone had an illness and that impacted their grades, or if there was a family member that was going through some struggles and that also impacted the student during their time at MIT, we can provide that context and tell the story in the committee letter um, in ways that can be hard for students if they don't have this. Um, and there's a variety of other institutions that your students might be considering that don't have this. So I would encourage you to think about this being a benefit in terms of choosing one school over the other um, in terms of a committee letter or not. We write a committee letter for every student, regardless of their GPA. Um, every student gets two opportunities to receive a, a committee letter. Um, and so that's all that I have. Um, and so thank you for your time. Um, we have about 19 minutes, so I just wanted to allow for some time for some questions. Um, so just going on... What medical schools were represented from for last year's graduates? Um, so there's roughly 150 plus medical schools. Um, there are some that are very common, um, like Columbia, HST, um, or Harvard, HMS, um, John Hopkins, Stanford, Northwestern, your Texas school. So we have applicants attending all of those, but we also have applicants attending Quinnipiac or Kaiser Permanente, which is fairly new, or um, Carl, Illinois. So it's it's fairly diverse, but we do have a high concentration of students attending top tier schools, um, which I would say is if we're going to use the U.S. News top 25 or top 50, um, I would say that that's a high representation of our students um, as well. How many MIT students get into the Harvard HST program each year? Um, it really varies. One year we had zero. The following year we had six. 
then, you know, it just really varies. And if I knew how to get people in into Harvard, um, HST, um, that would be a very different type of advising. I think we would be providing, but unfortunately we don't have that nuance, particularly once we get into the interview process, that's really what's gonna be the determining factor. Um, and we try to prepare students for that. Um, but I will say overall, I would say we do have a strong number of students attending HST every year. Um, both HST or Pathways, um, those are the two programs Harvard has. Pathways is your more traditional medical school where HST is a program designed for those who have an interest in the intersections between engineering and medicine. Um, and so I would say, I, I, I can't think of how many we have off the top of our head this year, um, right now, but I would say last year we had maybe about five students. Um, and we do have students that decide not to go to Harvard as well. Some students wanna go to warmer weather, um, they go to Stanford or they go to other places as well. Um, so it's also all about students' fit and, and their preferred interests. We try to support them around. Another question I have is, is the MDJD something that you folks have advised? Unfortunately, I have not advised anyone on that, but I do know that is an option. Um, the only combined degrees that we typically work with here are MD, PhD, um, but it's possible that other institutions, um, they maybe have more of a representation of MD, JD, but if we ever get one, we, we'd be happy to support them. I think in the coming years, based off a first year student that I've been working with, we might have our first MD uh, DVM, which is a, 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 this is a combined medical degree and a, um, a, a religious degree that you can get from a, a divinity degree. So it's a combined MD divinity degree. I didn't know about that. So I learned about it and that's something a student is uh, gonna be pursuing. I am record, recording this uh, session. It will be posted on our website um, at a later date. But my goal also is I'm seeing there's been about roughly 80 participants. Um, since I'm recording this, but also it's through my account, I can typically find the emails and I'll try to send that out as well. But if you don't get it, feel free to just email me and I'll send it to you or direct you to where the website is. And you'll definitely, you know, feel free to email me. I definitely can get it to you. Um, another person asked, when, what I meant is how hard is it would be to do that? You know, Challenging is a, a, a very varied word. Um, I've seen an applicant and, you know, one I think was memorable because I think with, I'm thinking of a student in particular that's H HST right now. Um, it's memorable because of the types of things this applicant was able to create in a mechanical engineering major. In particular, this person majored in MECI 2A. And 2A tends to have a medical leaning towards it or at least creating medical, medical mechanical engineering products that lead towards things that relate to medicine and healthcare. So if someone's been considering a medical engineering major or what we call MECI, you might want to consider the 2A option as well. Um, and so this student navigated the MECI, you know, uh, major well, went to HST, was involved in a lot of volunteer experiences, leadership. They were also an athlete. Um, but I also know applicants who struggled with biology or struggled with core six. Um, and maybe they overwhelm themselves with taking too many classes, or maybe they overwhelm themselves by involving themselves not only in a year up during their first semester on campus, taking classes, a few activities. Um, so, you know, in terms of MIT being challenging, it is challenging, but I think in terms of how applicants navigate that, it's really individualized. What I do try to encourage applicants to be mindful of is the amount of activities and amount of things they're engaged in. That's probably one of the more common reasons why applicants may not have the level of success that they hope for um, when it's time to apply and they're thinking about their GPA, it's often possible that they overwhelm themselves by doing way too many things and being potentially unsure if they can pull back from a year off or pull back from a leadership experience for one semester. So if that is ever the case for a student, they're unsure with it, whether they wanna stay involved in something or they're just wondering, the rigor here is intense, I'm involved in too many things. That's another common conversation I have with students of, well, it's okay to consider removing yourself from this experience or have you thought about maybe postponing it to this time period next semester? So that's a very common conversation we can have. So I'm hoping I'm answering that question to a degree, but I do find the degree to which MIT is challenging is very individualized regardless of the major itself. Um, do you offer pre-med help or workshops for MIT grads who decide to apply to medical school? Absolutely. So this is one of the unique aspects of our office the larger career advising and professional development office, meaning if you want to work with a career counselor, a career advisor on finding an internship or just applying to a job, meaning you're not working with them, particularly around your pre-med interests, they do have a cap with where they work with alumni. Excuse me. So the larger career advising office will work with alumni only up until two years out. 
After that, you transition to the alumni office. The little wing that we have called pre-health advising within CAPD, we work with alumni up until whenever. So we have a current applicant this cycle. They are 30 years old. Last cycle, we had an uh, applicant. They were 38, and they got into medical school. They're currently at BU. Um, so, you know, th there's no length at which we, we work with students. And if anything, I'm a huge proponent of taking a gap year. If anything, that's becoming more and more the, the norm uh, for most medical school students. Um, if anything, the average age of a medical school student at this point is roughly 22 to 25 or 23 to 25. So most people are taking gap years. Do you have, do you have to have a perfect GPA from MIT to get into a top medical school? No, that's not the case at all. Um, I would say... I've seen applicants have a 3.8 GPA get into meta, get into HST. I've seen applicants have a 518 MCAT score get into HST. I've seen applicants with a 4.0, 526 uh, not get into any medical school. I think it, there is the important realization that it's a lot more than just uh, what the um, your academics. It's your interview skills because you do have to interview at some point. Um, it's the degree to which you engage in service. Um, Leadership, your rec letters, the degree to which you have been able to network and develop good relationships with faculty, all these things come into the mix, your timing of the application to then determine where someone goes. But I have seen a wide spectrum of students getting to HST, not just a 4.0 and 528. Um, we heard that GPAs at MIT are generally lower at other colleges because of the rigor of the curriculum. Is that an issue when applicants from MIT are compared to applicants from other colleges? I can't necessarily speak to that comparison piece because I, I don't work within the admissions part, nor am aware of other colleges. But what I do know is when I'm working with an applicant that has a lower GPA, and when I'm kind of creating those lists where I'm showing them your GPA and your MCAT score, and let's say their their GPA is at a three five or a three six, three three point six on a four point zero scale. What I think the applicant and myself, and I've I've realized this over time. Um, I can't quantify it. But I do find an applicant with a lower GPA at MIT, it's possible they can have a greater chance of getting into a top tier school than maybe someone at a less competitive school compared to MIT. And I think it's a result of the rigor that everyone knows that MIT student is experiencing in comparison to maybe other schools um, here in Boston, here and across the country. Um, roughly what percentage of students get into medical school are international students? That's a really hard uh, data point to speak on in that we roughly maybe have one or two every cycle. Um, we don't have many. Um, I will say overall, it varies depending on the applicant. Um, and I, 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 because of the nature of these limited amount of applicants that we have, I, I wouldn't want to speak in a way that would, um, you know, showcase who this person might be. Um, but I've seen international students have success, and I've seen applicants that are international students not have success. And so if that is the case for your child, I would encourage them to meet with us as early as possible um, and really start thinking about how can they develop the strongest application possible, because that's really going to be the determining factor between one's success, whether they're international students or not, is their application. Um, I do want to highlight, I'm going to bring up a document that I think might even help um, demonstrate some of the things I'm talking about in terms of this more holistic, varied approach to um, the ways in which medical schools evaluate students, while also still trying to uh, make sure that I answer everyone's questions as well. Um, so I'm going to pull that up. And this is something I try to, um, I can't find the newest version that I sent. Um, It's coming up in a second. I'm just there with a little bit. Um, and so the document I'm, I'm going to be showing, it shows the importance of different categories, academics, experiences, demographics, and then the interview as it relates to the different things, medical, uh, different things a student can engage in. If you email me, I can send this to you, but it's also, it's online. Um, so you can find it. Um, where is it at? Thank you for your patience.
There you go. Okay. So this is a document. I probably show this to every student. Um, I think it's worthwhile for people to know the things medical schools are looking for. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, if you think about the mean importance ratings, this is 2023. It doesn't really change much. Um, the only difference that I think would be if you're an MD, PhD applicant, research would probably, not probably, it would be in the highest importance category. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, these four experiences are the most important experiences for an applicant. So the degree to which you've engaged in those are gonna impact your application, regardless of what these things look like. I also mentioned, we talked about MIT impacting one's, uh, the, the, how, how one is evaluated at MIT and is MIT taken into account? I mean, I, I can't quantify it, but it's here, selectivity of undergraduate institution. Um, so people are aware of the rigor of an MIT student, but I, I would hesitate to think that that should be the sole reason why um, one would get into medical school. The one area that's not listed here, and I wish they did list here, is recommendations. Um, recommend, recommendations carry a huge weight um, when, when it comes to uh, applicants' uh, application. Um, it's just my email. I'll put it in the, uh, the chat. Um, here's my email. And here is the main office's email. Um, if there's ever a need for the child might want to just talk to us, um, feel free to email the office. We have spoken to um, high school students who were accepted to MIT and, and considering the option even during the summer. Um, so that's always an option. But again, I just want to at least highlight this because I do find that this provides a little bit more clarity in terms of how the application process actually occurs um, as well. Um, in terms of thinking about what's the most important things to think about with the interview ultimately being the most important part um, as well. Um, so happy to uh, you know send these all out. Feel free to email me um, if you have any questions. Um, we have about six minutes remaining. Are there any other questions or thoughts, um, specific situations? Um, happy to answer or address anything. Um, but overall, I just want to thank everyone's time um, for, for joining us. Um, I do think MIT has been the, my favorite place to work since I've, I've been a professional. The students are amazing. Um, the nicest students. Um, the culture on campus is amazing. Um, that's another thing to think about. I, I can't speak specifically on other schools, but the pre-med culture here is extremely supportive. I think that's a result of some of the things that occur in the curriculum here at MIT. MIT promotes collaboration, so it's highly supportive. Um, what site would she be checked for the, uh, the website? Um, that's a great question. Um, I'm checking my staff. Uh, Yeah, and this also, this link also has, um, so this isn't up yet, obviously, but this link has a variety of other talks that our office has given. Um, and so once this is recorded um, and slightly um, edited, I will be posting it to this website, this YouTube channel that I just posted there. You're welcome. And you know, just uh, I, I was thinking, I was mentioning this earlier. Just as you consider, and I, I, I absolutely can't speak on any other school. As you consider other schools, just really start to try to tune into the pre-med culture um, in terms of it being supportive. Is it highly competitive? Um, and just what that looks like, and try to figure out how that might relate to one's preferred interest in attending a school or not. Um, but overall, I can say that the pre-med community here has been been amazing um, in terms of. Uh, the types of students that we work with, highly supportive, always thinking about ways to create new opportunities for students. Um, and this is, I'm speaking from the students themselves, um, a really great group of students here at MIT. Um, and I, I, I think I can speak for Abdul and Erica. We all love working here and working with the students um, and, and hope to work with your students in the future as well. Um, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions, um, email me or email the office as well. Um, and we have three more minutes, um, so I'll be sticking around in the event there's any other questions, um, but you're welcome for everyone that's attending. Thanks for joining.